Hello. Today we're going to look at a simple proof that the transversality condition is a necessary condition for our infinite horizon maximization problem under certain circumstances. Now, I'd like to say a little word before we begin, which is that these proofs came out after I had finished graduate school. Um, of course, when I was in graduate school, we learned about transversality conditions and so on, and some of us struggled with the idea. What's my point? My point is that somebody out there, instead of just looking at the transversality condition in their class and just learning it and moving forward, looked at this thing, which was received wisdom, and thought, you know, I think I can do this better. I think I can figure out a cleaner way to show why it is that this condition is required. So always keep in mind that whatever you're being taught in class is something that you might be able to improve upon. And keep that in mind when doing your research. All right, just a reminder of where we are. We are trying to solve this discrete time dynamic programming problem where the key is that we may have unbounded returns. And we were seeing that a necessary condition for an optimum is going to be this, which we call the transversality condition. In some texts, the transversality condition is written this way, as I mentioned, you can get from here to here, from this one to this one by combining this condition and the Euler equation. So let's focus on this one and get cracking on the proof. So for the proof, we're going to consider an alternative path, which is going to be like this. It starts at x0 star, and then follows the positive optimal path up to some date, which we're going to call big T. From then on, it differs from the proposed optimal path by a factor lambda at each date. And so on for some lambda between zero and one. We know that this path is feasible because of the convexity of the constraint set, gamma, big gamma. And because we know that our original path x star is optimal, we must have that the following condition holds. The utility from the optimal path must be at least as large as the utility from this proposed alternative path. Now, up until date t, the two paths are the same. So the difference in utility between the two paths is going to only be what happens from date t going forward. And of course, that is just this expression. Remember at day t, of course, the alternative path um, doesn't start to be different until day t plus one, but of course that actually matters at date big t. So 
So this is the first date which the two paths diverge. So, oops. So this plus what happens next. For this, we want the sum from t equals big T plus one to infinity. That's going to be beta to the t times something that looks like this expression. The difference is, of course, we have lambdas on both going forward. This must be, of course, less than or equal to zero. Since by optimality of our proposed path x star, we know that no other feasible path can exceed it in terms of utility. Divide through by the factor one minus lambda. And rearranging this equation, going to end up with the finding that this must be, of course, less than or equal to this whole thing. Of course, I need to switch the signs of this to make this correct. Now the next step is to show that this is in fact less than or equal to the difference between u at the optimum and u evaluated at zero. How come? Well, it turns out that this result follows directly from the fact that u is concave. So let's take an aside and have a look at how come this inequality here, this last inequality, holds. So let's go to a different page. We'll come back in a second. Suppose that you have some function that goes from zero to one and maps into the real numbers. And suppose it is concave such that f of one is not negative infinity then we will have the result that f of 1 minus f of lambda divided by 1 minus lambda must be strictly less than f of 1 minus f of 0. This should be intuitive as it follows immediately from the definition of this function being concave. The definition of a function being concave is that for any lambda between zero and one, which is what we're thinking about, f of lambda x plus or minus lambda y, must be greater than or equal to lambda f of x plus minus lambda f of y. That's what it means for a function to be concave. And this should be true for any x, for any y, and for any lambda between 0 and 1. 
Now setting x and y equals zero becomes x is one, y is zero, x is one, y is zero. Now rearranging this, we have f of zero minus lambda f of zero. Let's do a little rearrangement here. We're going to add f of one to this side and subtract f of one as well. And you can see that we can now group some terms. In particular, we have this that we can put here, this that we can put here, and we will realize that we can extract a common factor of one minus lambda here. One minus lambda, and inside we'll end up with f of zero minus f of one. This we can put over here with a minus sign on it. Now let's multiply everything by minus one. So the sign flips here. The direction of this inequality flips too. These two also flip sign. Finally, divide both sides by one minus lambda, and we're done. Now that we've established this inequality, we have two steps left to go. First one is to send lambda to one. Well, if we send lambda to one, what's going to happen to this equation? Well, we're going to end up with this expression, sorry, turning into just the negative of the discounted derivative of u with respect to its second argument times x star t plus one. Now we know that this has to be positive because we know that this derivative has to be negative. It reflects the fact essentially that investment is costly. And furthermore, we know from here that this must also be true. Next, send big T to infinity. 
And what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get zero is less than or equal to the negative limit as t goes to infinity of this. And we know, of course, that this has to be less than or equal to the limit of this as it goes to infinity. And actually, we know what the value of this is. It's zero. How come it's zero? It's zero because we know that this limit um, exists. We know that this is bounded. It was one of the initial assumptions that we made when deciding what properties we needed, what properties we required of the function u. And that gives us our desired result because we have that this expression is getting squeezed on one side by zero as t goes to infinity and on the other side by zero as well. It's trapped, therefore it must equal zero. And that is the proof. So that is the proof of the transversality condition where the last step follows because you're infinitely discounting something, actually two numbers, that are known to be positive, as in not infinite. They're bounded, and so you're infinitely discounting them, and so their value tends to zero.